they were, they were dealing with a crisis of faith. Maybe you've had one of those before. Lord knows in the world that we live in today, it's, uh, it can be an all-out it can be an all-out war and attack on the faith of the people of God. When, when you see all the bad that's going on, it can cause us really, even as people who believe in God, to say, how is it that a God who is so great could, could be doing so little to stop the, the tide of violence and evil that seems to just be coming overwhelming? We see things like a little boy who, who uh, hasn't even reached kindergarten yet, who's, who's in a cancer ward. We, we see stories of little girls who were abducted and taken into the sex trafficking uh, trade. We, we hear stories every week, isn't it? Like, you know, a terrorist attack here, or kids getting shot up in Orlando, Florida, or, or somebody just walking down the street in London, a tourist who gets stabbed by a, a guy that's gone crazy. We, we hear these stories like that we're bombarded with them. And um, sometimes, honestly, it can be hard to maintain our faith in a God that we cannot see amidst all this evil that we can not only see, but we can hear, taste, touch, and smell. But what I believe today is that the call of the people of God is to embody a faith that is strong enough to withstand all of that mess. A faith that can continue to remain strong and firm and steadfast and not shrink back even when the waves of adversity and evil come crashing in with their relentless regularity that today, if ever there was a day when a people were needed who were a people of strong faith in the midst of a chaotic time, it is today. And it might as well be us, right? Troubled times call for a strong Faith, And we are not, absolutely not, the first people to ever be in a, in a circumstance or at a day and time where, uh, where faith is difficult. All the way through the scriptures, there are people that had what I would consider to be crisis of faith. Even uh, King David in Psalm 73, he's looking at the world around him. He's like, you know what, as I'm seeing everything here, it's like the wicked people are prospering. They don't have any trouble whatsoever. I'm trying to be a righteous man. I'm trying to get it right. It doesn't seem to be very rewarding to be living this way of life. He has a crisis of faith. The folks that we're going to be walking alongside a little bit this morning, um, let me describe them for you. It was a house church not near as in big in number, even as the number of people that we have in this room this, this, right now. It was sometime between 60 and 70 AD, and they were enduring an incredible time of hardship and persecution where the world that they thought they knew was now no longer the same. They were watching as some of their friends were being drugged out of their houses, put into prison, and in some cases executed. Not because they had committed some heinous crimes against humanity, but because they had an unwavering and unyielding faith in Jesus that they would not deny. They watched as their friends were losing their jobs and being forced into an impoverished way of life. Not because there was a bad turn in the economy or, the, or they had some kind of bad work ethic, but simply because they were continuing to be people of faith in a world that was calling them to deny that faith. And in the face of that, the, the, the example of these folks that were standing strong, going to prison, going to death, some of their friends were like, that example inspires me. I, I'm, I'm not going to recant. I'm not going to deny. I'm not going to be of those who shrink back and who are destroyed, but I will be of those who who stand firm and believe and are saved. But there were others. There were others who were watching this scenario like, man, it's kind of hard to be a person of faith in this world. It gets you abuse and persecution and all kinds of, and they were beginning to have second thoughts about whether or not they really wanted to stay true to Jesus because the circumstances were so chaotic around them. In the middle of that kind of a, of a, of a culture, we get this sermon that is called Hebrews. And that's what it is. Before it was a letter, it was a sermon that was preached to real people in a real place, just like you and me. A people who were, who were on the verge of either staying strong or of shrinking back and denying their faith. And as uh, one of the ways that, that the preacher uses to encourage the people there is to give them some examples. Examples of people who, in the midst of difficult times, got it right and continued to remain strong. So we're going to be uh, in Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 and then verses 8 through 16 this morning. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there, or you can pull it up on your smartphone if you got the Bible app, or if you don't have that, it'll be on the screen. And I will, if you're able, invite you to stand in honor of the word. Hebrews 
Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Now down to verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power of procreation, even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. So, the preacher wanting, wanting to basically, the message of, of Hebrews is real simple. Don't give up. Don't shrink back. Don't lose heart. Don't lose faith. It's a tough world. It's a struggle. But I'm telling you, hang in there and God will make good on his promises. In a nutshell, that is what he, the, the Sermon of Hebrews is trying to accomplish in the lives of some folks who are in a very tenuous time in, in their own faith. So God gives them an example. Let's talk about Abraham. There's a bunch of them in chapter 11, but this morning we're just going to spend, and not even the whole Abraham story, just a little piece of it. In verse 8, it says, okay, here's how it got started for Abraham. God called him. We, we know this story from back in Genesis 12, okay? God comes to Abraham and says, all right, here's the deal. You, you, don't, you don't have any descendants. You don't, even have, you don't even have one son. You're an old man. He's 75 years old. But I am going to make you into a great nation. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And I'm asking you right now to get up and go. And Abraham was like, okay, where are we going? God said, I'm not telling you until you get there. So in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 11, the writer, the preacher wants us to know that this life of faith for Abraham started off the same way it starts off for all of us. He didn't have a clue. Kind of like when you get married. <laughs> Contrary to how it may appear to folks that are maybe new to the faith or they've been around somebody that's been a Christian for a very long time, none of us start following God with a very clear picture of ex exactly everything that's going to mean. Abraham did not have a clue, but what he did have was faith. Faith that the God who spoke to him was for real. Faith that the promise that God made to him, even though it looked like it was absolutely impossible and ridiculous in the present moment, faith to believe that what looked impossible now would be possible later because God said it was going to be that way. That's what faith does. It doesn't just have an intellectual assent to a, a statement of a, a, a bunch of doctrinal statements. Faith in God is like action, right? Right? And so the very next day after God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, he got up not knowing where he was going and said, all right, God, I'm here, let's go. And faith for Abraham really is kind of the same as it is for all of us. In order to step into a life of faith, Abraham had to step out of a life of comfort and security and everything kind of settled the way he... If you're looking for an, a predictable, safe whatever way of life, then don't follow Jesus. Are you, are you hearing me now? Stepping into faith for Abraham, I want you to know what all that meant stepping away from. His life in Haran. Abraham's 75 years old, which means his dad is way older than that. His dad was very wealthy. 
um, some research that I did this last week said that, that, that he lived in a house that was a well-established house. In fact, during that time period, most of the houses were lived in by three different generations, all at the same time. So it would have been Abraham's dad, Abraham, and he didn't have any kids, but his brother did. So some of those little kids running around. And it was a firmly established, you know, nice, concrete, tangible, safe predictable, this is where we live. And because Abraham's dad was wealthy, he stood to inherit a pretty good inheritance as soon as his dad kicked off, which again, Abraham's 75 years old. It's not gonna be a long time before that comes true. And God says to him, I want you to walk away from the safety, the security, the predictability, the comfort of all that is Haran and step out into a future that I have for you that's gonna be more amazing than you can ever imagine. But if you're gonna attain this, you gotta let go of that. Which is really the way it is for all of us, right? In order to step into a relationship with God, a faith in Jesus Christ, there's some other stuff we got to step out of. And if we are not willing to step out of whatever lies behind, then we will never be able to step fully into what God says lies ahead. And that's where some of us get in trouble because we like security. We like predictable. We like, we like safety. We like, I can understand this. I can grab hold of this. And you're asking me to go into something that I don't know anything other than what you're telling me, God. And you're giving me like this much information. And God's like, yeah, pretty much that's it. That's how it works. So Abraham leaves in faith. Now you say, why would that part of the story be important for a people who were the ones I just described. I mean, they're having a hard time. Some of them are wanting to shrink back and he's trying to say, we're not of those who shrink back. We stand firm. Our faith moves ahead. We're not, we're not, we're not. Why would this part, because here's why, here's why I think it is. In a chaotic time, which is what's going on here in Hebrews 11. And really, I think it's kind of what's going on in our world today. In a chaotic time, it does good to get some examples of people who were true to the faith, even in the midst of chaos. Right? Sometimes the chaos is created by the world. Sometimes the chaos is created by God when we say yes to him. Abraham. Hey man, life's pretty good. Got my mom and pop. Got this inheritance waiting for me. I don't have any kids, but it's okay. You know what? And then all of a sudden God disrupts everything. Sometimes when Jesus gets a hold of us, I mean, he does bring order out of chaos, but sometimes he, the, that's when the chaos starts. Of this adventure of following God. Where are we going? I'll, I'll tell you as we go there. But what it means to be a people of faith is to have such trust and such confidence in God that whatever he says to walk away from, we're willing to walk away from it. Even if we don't know what it means we're walking into other than he's, got, he's large and in charge and he's leading me this way. So I want you to look at a couple different verses. I'm going to look at verse 10. It says that Abraham looked forward to a city that he, it wasn't his yet, to a promise that was not yet attained. He had a forward-looking mentality. And that's what we as people of faith have to do. It was, honestly, it was not a pie in the sky, everything's gonna be wonderful, let's not worry about this mess that is reality right now. Abraham knew reality. He understood it. You know when he understood? He understood it every morning when he got up. And his back was stiff, from sleeping on the ground and he got up and stepped out of a tent instead of out of a house and he looked into a future and said, God, I have no idea what's going to happen today other than I'm with you and you're with me. Chaos, uncertainty, unpredictability. And the immediacy of the right now, Abraham was aware of that every time he went and laid down at night and he laid down beside his aging past childbearing years, barren wife, with the promise in his mind that I will make you the father of many nations. The reality of it was, I'm in a tent. I left home. I'm with a barren woman. I've got a promise. And Abraham continued to walk in faith, even though he couldn't see right now. That's what people of God do. We don't ignore the current reality. It is what it is. We don't put our head in the sand and not blunders on and let's just come to the safety and security of the sanctuary. It's all going to be okay. Real faith is exercised in a real world and we got to be aware of what's going on around us, right? Amen. Abraham looked forward. C.S. Lewis, 
said that um, if you study history, you will find that the Christians who made the greatest impact in the present were those who thought about the future the most. How many of y'all gotten discouraged by the mess that is the world right now? How much time do you spend dwelling on the promises of God that are going to be fulfilled? That he will restore all things. That he will renew a creation gone bad. That there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Sometimes it's the awareness of what will happen later on that gives us the strength to stand firm in the here and now when it's nothing but a mess. That's what people of faith do. We don't put blinders on to what's right now, but we realize there's more going on than what's right now. So Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, tells a story about an admiral named uh, Stockdale. And back in the uh, Vietnam era, he, he was an officer. His plane got shut down, shot down. And he spent seven years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And one of the surprising things in this story was that he was an older man at the time, but he was able to withstand the abuse and all the other stuff that a lot of younger people that seemingly were more strong physically, um, they didn't make it through. So he came through on the other side of that. He got out and um, Jim Collins did an interview with him and he said, you know, he was like, what was the key to that? How did you survive it? And, and he said, basically, there were a few things that got me through it. The, the entire time. One is, um, I refuse to believe that what I could see right now was the only thing that was happening. And two, I refuse to ignore how harsh the reality of what, what was going on right now really was. So he said, I got up every morning and there were three things that I did. The first thing I said was, I looked around and you're still in a horrible place. Point number one. The second thing I would tell myself is, this is James Stockdale, you're not always going to be here. And the third thing he would say is, in light of number two, you're not always going to be here, then how do you live and how do you act today in light of that future that, that, that is going to come at some point? You know what that is? I think that's real, that's real world. I'm still here and the situation's terrible. That's real world. I'm not always going to be here. That's real faith. So how do I live in the here and now, in the light of all this mess, with the belief and the promise that what God said is going to happen and it's going to come true? That's faithful living in a real world. And that is what the preacher of Hebrews is trying to instill in a group of people that aren't sure they want to, they want to continue to walk in the faith because of everything that it's costing them. Real faith takes stock in what's going on in the right now, but it realizes there's something more. There's something more out there. And that something more is intimately tied to the promises that have been made through Jesus, the Son of God, to his people. Verse 15. Abraham had every opportunity and every reason to look back. Man, he's staying in a tent. Mom and dad are back home. They're, they're kicking back by the fireplace, got their feet up after a long day. They're sipping some tea, and man, isn't life wonderful? And Abraham's like, man, that rock is really hard. Every reason and every opportunity in the world to get a little bit into that walk of faith and say, you know what, this is kind of hard. I think I'm going back. And you guys have had that opportunity as well. You know, one of the reasons I'm praying for our teenagers is because I know before this week is over, they're going to have a temptation to walk back. Some of them had phenomenal experiences with Jesus this summer. Got saved at camp, got locked into a relationship with Christ through the youth group. They're going to be stepping into the whirlwind and the chaos that is school year again. And before this week is over, you can take it to the bank. You guys ought to pray for them too. There will, some of those kids are going to be tempted to go back to life as it was before Jesus because it was, it was easier, it was more predictable, it was whatever. And don't kid yourself because there are some adults in this room that are faced with the same temptation. When it gets overwhelming, whenever it gets difficult, when we don't understand what God is doing and why he's taking so long and why this isn't happening, the temptation to go back, that's one of the tools the enemy has always used. 
You know, we see it later in the story in Genesis. Lot's wife turns around, looks back. What happens to her? Pillar of salt. The people of Israel, they get broken out of the bondage in Egypt by Moses, the leader, and God who's in power and all that. They get into the wilderness, start to have a tough time. You know what some of them start saying? It was a lot easier back in Egypt. Luke chapter 9. Jesus is calling people to be followers of him. The third guy says to him, hey, I'll follow you, but I want to go back and see my family. Jesus says, that's not how it works. Anybody who puts their hand to the plow and looks back, Luke 9, 26, is not worthy of service in the kingdom of God. The writer, the preacher of Hebrews is saying about Abraham, he could have looked back. He could have gone back. He didn't do that. And I don't want you to do it either. I know it's hard, I know it's struggle, I know the world is chaotic, but we are a people of faith. And the, man, some of the times the best context for faith to be lived out is the chaos and craziness of a world that needs to see a people called the people of God who are remaining firm in the faith no matter what gets thrown at them. So essentially that's the message of Hebrews. And by way of Abraham... The preacher says to him, hey, when we all got started, nobody had a clue what they were doing. So it's okay. Maybe this morning, there are some of you that have never taken that first step of faith. Faith in Jesus to be the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life. Maybe the opportunity hasn't been there. Maybe it's been there and you're like, I don't know if I want to do all that. I'm telling you this morning, I mean, I'm painting a picture of a life of faith that's pretty crazy, but it's the best life ever. I mean, thank you, Pastor H. I'm glad there's somebody else following Jesus here, but the life of faith is the best life ever. If you've never taken that first step of, maybe I should trust in something more than what's settled and secure and what I can control. And I should put my faith and trust in a God who loved me enough to send his son to come for me. Today would be a great day, a great day for that to happen. But if like, the hearers of this sermon, you find yourself in a spot where your faith has been tested. You've questioned, you've worried, you've wondered, you've, you've wrestled, you've... Can I just tell you today, take heart. We are not of those who shrink back and who are destroyed. We are of those who believe and are saved, whose faith is rooted and grounded in something far greater and far stronger than the chaos that we see around us, but is rooted and grounded in the promises of a God who always is good on what he says. Does that make any sense to you guys? Does it help you any? If ever there was a time when strong faith and real faith was needed in a real world, it's today. If ever there was a people that needed to show it, well, it might as well be us, right? Joe, come on up. We're going to sing a song. What is it going to be? What's the song? Waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. So here's the invitation. Or I guess, because here's what we believe around here. And I know I'm seeing some new faces. Really glad you guys are here this morning. But our conviction at Grace Church of Nazarene is that every time the word is proclaimed, whether it's a sermon or a Sunday school lesson or a small group conversation, every time that word gets out, it's intended to do something within and evoke some kind of a response in us. Now, it may be a response of, um, you know, prayer. God, thank you that I'm not wavering in my faith. I know the only reason I'm standing firm is because you're with me. That's a good response. It might be a response of, I've been feeling like my faith has been battered. God, I need some strength today. I need some help because I don't want to shrink back. I don't want to fall back. I want to keep leaning forward and not go back. I just, I need your help today. That's a good response. It might be a response of, I've never taken a step of faith in my life. I think I'd like to try that today. That's a great response. However God wants you to respond, you can do it in your seat. You can do it by kneeling at an altar and talking to God about it there. All I want is to, I don't know, I just want you to do whatever God wants you to. You do that. And it's a good day, right? So I'm gonna, I am going to invite you to stand as we sing, kind of make it easier for you if you need to move in any direction. And after we sing this song, um, I'll pray for us.